some of the research that's been done in restoration of ponderous pine trees has illustrated that when you thin out the excess trees and reintroduce fire when you burn, then a couple of major mechanisms occur that increase the tree's health and their resilience and resistance to insect attack. So one of those lines is with uh, the resin production. So the way that ponderosa pine trees prevent uh, bark beetle infestation and mortality is that they produce resins which they exude, kind of sap that's uh, got a lot of toxins in it, and they physically push the uh, bark beetles out so they can't damage the tree. After restoration treatments, what we found is that the resin pressure, the amount of resin flow that comes out of these ponderous pine trees, is about 50% greater than it was before. Uh, in dense stands, the resin production is so low that they can't really resist a bark beetle, a consistent bark beetle attack. After restoration treatments, we find that the resin production is so high that there's basically no way a bark beetle is going to get in there and damage the tree. The other thing we found is that looking at the canopy feeding insects, in canopy feeding insects, the major mechanism for resisting uh, sawflies and other defoliating insects is the toughness of the foliage. It's how hard it is to chew it up essentially. And what we found is that in restored sites that have been thinned and burned in ponderosa pine, this foliage toughness is so great that it's just not attractive anymore to foliage feeding insects. The idea on the Uncompagra project, like many of the restoration projects throughout the West, is to first determine what the natural conditions were. What was the carrying capacity of the land? What's the natural tree densities and patterns? How much understory production was there and so on? What was the age distribution of the trees? That then becomes a reference point for designing restoration treatments that uh, reestablish something like those pre-settlement conditions before logging, before fire exclusion, before heavy livestock grazing. So then the idea is once you get them in that general ballpark, not necessarily exactly like it was historically, but in that ballpark, reintroduce fires, that these ecosystems will be self-regulating. They'll naturally be resistant to the damaging agents, not just insects and disease, but also unnatural crown fires and other damaging elements that can alter ecosystem structure and function. We've had research going on for, um, like at Northern Arizona University, for about 40 years on how do you do restoration treatments. And we've proven this out at small scales, at scales of um, tens of acres, hundreds of acres, kind of the stand scale. At the same, same time that we're answering those kind of restoration questions, how do you do it, what are the in impacts, how does this actually work, and so on, we've had crown fires getting bigger and bigger and more and more devastating. So the intersection of the body of research that's been built up that says, here's some ways to make this happen at the small scale, and then these huge dis disturbances of crown fire, unnaturally large and devastating insect attacks, has led to um, a national program of work to try to restore natural conditions, not just at the stand level, but over vast landscapes. So instead of just operating on hundreds of acres to thousands of acres, now what we're looking at is trying to do restoration at the scale of hundreds of thousands to millions of acres. And throughout the West, there are a, a number, uh, there are nine right now sites where uh, large landscape restoration is being sort of piloted. How do we do this? A critical element of that is the collaborative process. When you're dealing with a stand, most people are not gonna care about it, you know, a few thousand of acres. But when you're talking about um, restoring millions of acres, then that's an impact that's big enough where you need to have the stakeholders, those who care about the land especially, who make a living off the land, and who have to live with the outcomes of restoration treatments need to be engaged in designing, monitoring, and evaluating these large landscape restoration treatments. I think it's really exciting to be where we are right now because the, the research that has been done over the past 40 years has been kind of anticipatory 
most of us who had been following landscape health over that uh, any length of time have seen the deterioration in landscape conditions. And so it's what's really exciting now is it's not just the conservation professionals, the foresters and wildlife managers and rain managers, so on, or the scientists that see the need to do this, but it's also recognized by the general public and very importantly by elected officials from the municipal to the county to the state to the federal level. And it's really bringing all of those elements together that's essential to, so that we can address restoration at the scale and at the pace that's necessary so that we can leave a healthy landscape legacy to our children and grandchildren.